I've talked to a number of people who are excited about this opportunity to explore God. One individual who came to the training last week said, well, what if the people that I'm inviting over say things that, uh, that are, I don't agree with or that are weird? I thought, whoa, no. You know? <laughs> I said, well, they already believe those things. Why not invite them in your home where you can talk and be open and listen and may, perhaps they would discover the God who can answer their questions better than any of us can. When I, my wife and I celebrated our 25th anniversary this past summer, we, we went to the island of Kauai. Never been to any of the islands. It was nice, but it's a long way over there and back. Uh, and I noticed that there was, uh, there, when we landed, immediately there was a different vibe. Island living has its own kind of vibe and lifestyle. People talked about it, the mahalo and the aloha spirit. Everybody's got flip-flops. Everybody's, you know, relaxed on their own schedule. Uh, I kind of like that. It took me a few days to settle in and enjoy it. My wife and I laugh that when we go on vacation, it takes me three days to unwind, and by the third day, she wants to go home, no matter where we are. <laughs> so we were worried that we wouldn't line up, but we, we were in sync. We had a blast. But there was a sign in our little uh, place that we rented that said, uh, enjoy the island lifestyle. And I thought about that, that there is a kind of lifestyle you live there, and then you come back, and you have to readjust to the pace of suburban lifestyle. And I, and I, you know, there's, people live different kinds of lifestyles. People are trying to live different kinds of lifestyles. It's not hard to see them. I thought about a few of them to put up here. I have some friends that used to attend our church. They moved to the city, young couple, because they love the city lifestyle, urban living. They, they like the energy and the lights and the nightlife, and they like walking to places, and they like the city. So, and you know people that perhaps that used to be you, and they'll get older and a little tired, and they want to move out to the suburbs and settle down. But people want to live the city lifestyle. There's, there's also, what, uh, when we went on uh, about four years ago with my folks on to celebrate their 50th anniversary, my mom and dad rented a lake house in Georgia, and we all went to help them celebrate 50 years of marriage. And, you know, there was a big sign, lake life, over the door when you walked in. Lake lifestyle, right? Relax, boating, have fun. Some of you may have lake cottages or have friends who do. They want to live that lifestyle. And then uh, Pastor Bruce is very much a part of this lifestyle, the running lifestyle. Team World Vision, they all ran the marathon of almost 90 runners and people that are runners, they, it's a particular kind of lifestyle you live. You organize your life around it. Or the beach lifestyle, this is what my wife would prefer to live all the time, but alas, we live in Illinois. <laughs> and it's not hard to look around and see what kind of lifestyle people are living or trying to live. But what would it look like? What does a lifestyle of prayer look like? What does prayer lifestyle look like? How could you tell if someone is living a lifestyle of prayer? Would there be a sign over their door? Are there particular shoes that prayer people wear? Are there prayer sandals you have to wear? How can you tell? As I mentioned, I'm in a prayer group with pastors in the, in the Fox Valley area. We meet monthly, as I said, on Thursday. We have lunch together at one of our locations, and then after we've eaten and talked and caught up personally, we go into the sanctuary and we pray for the work of God in that place and for the people of God in that place. One of the pastors in that group is a man named Dan Rack. Pastor Dan is a pastor at Trinity Vineyard Church in St. Charles. He's an engineer in his second career. He's uh, significantly older than I am, soft-spoken, and, you know, he doesn't have a whole lot to offer when we talk about leadership and evangelism and those kinds of things. He's pretty quiet. But when he prays, you feel the presence of God. I can feel the depth of his love for Jesus when he prays. It, he doesn't appreciate this, but I say it's almost like an odor. It exudes out of him, you know. <laughs> I'm not trying to be over-spiritual, but I, I can tell that Pastor Dan prays, that life, prayer is a lifestyle for him. And it makes me want more of that in my life. Maybe you've been around people like that. You can feel it. You don't need a sign or a poster. You can just tell that they walk with God and they pray. 84% of Americans say they pray regularly. Nearly a third of those who profess to be atheists say they pray. I find that curious. To whom it may concern, what do they do? <laughs> just about everybody says they pray. But most of us, when we talk about prayer, and sadly, even many Christians, we think about prayer as an internal dialogue with ourselves. We might not say that, but most people think about prayer as turning inward. This is certainly true of Eastern religions and many conglomerate 
faiths of our, own, of our day. But for the Christ follower, prayer is not fundamentally turning inward, but turning upward. Turning our hearts and tuning them, we sing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. It's tuning and turning upward. The goal of prayer is real personal connection with the God of the universe who made you and who desires a relationship with you. Fundamentally, that's what prayer is. This relationship of the, with the Father was marked the life of Jesus on earth. It's hard sometimes. We, we make the mistake of thinking of Jesus solely as the Son of God in his deity, and he was fully divine. He was also fully human, the mystery of the Incarnation. And if you read through the Gospels, you see these repeated occasions where he's praying, and his disciples are hearing him pray, seeing him pray, watching him pray, going to find him at prayer. Mark chapter 1, verses 35 to 37, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed, went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. His disciples came to find him, they came seeking him. Where did they find him? Praying. Praying. Jesus was always at prayer. Sometimes long extended periods of intense prayer. Sometimes little moments. Matthew 14, verse 23. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. We see Jesus in prayer in Matthew 19 when he placed his hands on little children and people brought their children to him to pray for them and to bless them. In, John, in Matthew 15, he prayed for the Father to bless before he fed the 5,000. He took the few loaves and fishes and he prayed a prayer of blessing and multiplied them. In John 11, he prays a prayer of thanks that God the Father listens to him and hears his prayer and our prayers. In Luke 9, his face was radiant as he prayed on the Mount of Transfiguration. In John 12, he prays that his Father would be glorified. In Matthew 26, he prays, If it's your will, let this cup pass from me in the garden. Yet not my will, but your will be done. And in Luke 23, he prays on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Those are just a few of the examples of the life of prayer that Jesus lived. I think you could make the case that if what was Jesus' life marked by most Obedience to the will of the Father and prayer. Just take, it, take some time. If you have need of a new study, comb through the Gospels and look for the prayer life of Jesus. I want to focus on just two verses from Luke chapter 5 for the rest of our time this morning. Two verses that are really relevant for us today. They're packed, actually with, I think, application for us about the prayer life of Jesus and about our prayer life, what it ought to be. Luke 5, verses 15 and 16. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him, to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. It's a pretty simple statement. Great crowds gathered around everywhere Jesus went, he had people that wanted something from him, healing, blessing, insight, wisdom, wherever he went. We, I think it's easy to think of Jesus as, you know, he's kind of a long-haired, wandering sage. He doesn't have much to do. He doesn't have a home. He's homeless. He just, you know, he's kind of just gets up in the morning and wanders around and heals some random people and says some wise things, and then eventually he gets killed. Wouldn't it be nice, except for the killed part, if we could just kind of live our lives doing whatever? This verse alone tells us that's a fundamental misunderstanding of Jesus. Nobody had more to accomplish in his three years of public ministry than Jesus of Nazareth, and less time to do it in. In fact, this little, these two verses are crammed in between the calling of the first disciples, the healing of a paralytic. And the healing of the paralytic story, some of you will know this, is um, before this is when they, he's, giving a, he's teaching to crowds in a house, and they're tearing apart the roof and lowering their friend down on a mat, interrupting him. Everywhere he went, people were pressing in on him, wanting something from him. Does your life ever feel like there's just no margin? I've just got too much to do. Every time I turn around, somebody wants something from me. And I can't get it all done. 
Sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes, like a friend of mine said, I'm not trying to make anybody else happy. I'm just trying, trying not to make anybody else mad at me. Right? I'm just trying to just get by. Jesus had a very busy life. And yet, I think those two verses are put together for a reason. Everywhere he went, the crowds gathered and everybody wanted something from him, but he often withdrew to lonely places, desolate places, to pray. This is really important for us. It reminds me of when I was in Ecuador, the first time we ever took a trip to Ecuador as a church uh, down, in, uh, down south of Quito in the Amazon basin. We don't go there anymore. It's too close to the Colombian border. It's too dangerous. But we did for a couple of years when I was there. And one of the leaders on our trip was a doctor, uh, or had medical training, and um, was part of a different church, but it was kind of joined with us. We had a smaller group at the time of students. And we went into this remote village in the Amazon basin. It took us like a 12-hour bus ride, then a four-hour canoe ride, dugout canoe ride to reach this village. We got there. It was like the Discovery Channel. I'm thinking, what are we doing here? I'm responsible for these students, and we are in the middle of nowhere. But Rick Borman, who was our guide, was with us. And when the villagers in that that, that village found out there was a doctor with us, there was a buzz. You could feel it. And they told other villagers, and we were there for four days. People walked for two days to get, or, or canoed, to get to that village and waited in line for hours and hours and hours. It might be the only chance they would have a ch- to, to see a real doctor. Just waiting, and he was so patient with them. We see Jesus here, wherever he goes, people are flocking to him, hearing about him. And yet he prayed. Now, if Jesus needed consistent times of prayer with his Father in order to live the life the Father had laid out for him, how crazy of us to think that we don't. I mean, if if you're a Christ follower this morning, if you're here and you have wrestled with the identity of Jesus in the Scriptures and you've said he is the living God made flesh, he did die for my sins, he did rise again to give me the hope of eternity, and the Spirit does come into my life, if that's true about you, I don't mean you have it all figured out. I mean you have settled that issue and you have surrendered your life to him. Then the Father says he invites you into a kind of life, a life of obedience to him, a life of blessing and joy but obedience to him. How are you going to live that life if you're not serious about prayer? When Jesus himself, who also was called by the Father to live a life of obedience, needed times of prayer with his Father. I don't mean prayer a couple of times a week when you're with other Christians, you know, the formal kind of prayer, or prayer at mealtimes. My uncle, who's not much for praying, my aunt made him pray one time, and I still remember that. I was like 10 years old, we were at his house, and she said, would you pray? And he never wanted to pray, and so he did, and he, here's his prayer. Good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. That's what he said. We all looked like, is it, is it okay to eat? Are we going to get indigestion now after that prayer? Does that count? Some of us think of prayer as like obligatory things we do. Our lives need to be constantly realigned Last year I read a book by James K.A. Smith called Desiring the Kingdom, where he says we suffer from what he calls disordered loves. We have, our hearts are misaligned. We put the wrong loves in the top places in our hearts. Love of family and love of children and love of work, those are all good things, but we put them over love of God. Love of nation, love of political party, all these things. We were disordered in our loves, and one of the primary things following Jesus means is he reorders our hearts, reorders our loves to get them right. It's what Jesus meant when he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Get first things first. I think part of what happens in prayer, not just at mealtime or in church time, but when you withdraw to seek your Father is he reorders your heart. He realigns your loves. He sorts that stuff out. It doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen once. It happens over and over and over again. In his book, Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer, C.S. Lewis wrote these letters, similar to screw tape letters. These are imaginary letters, but this is actually Lewis writing to an imaginary friend named Malcolm. Some of his friends thought that this was Letters to Malcolm Muggeridge, but it was an invented man, where you're reading one side of a conversation via letter about prayer. He writes, we may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. The real labor is to remember 
and to attend. In fact, to come awake still more, to remain awake to his presence. I think that's what prayer is, at least for me. Prayer is staying awake to his presence. Because we can sleepwalk through life. Did you know that spiritually? And you can think you're living the real life when you're actually not. Lewis said the essence of prayer is this reawakened awareness to the reality of God in all of life. It was in the anthem. I was struck by it as we sung it. Everywhere that man may be, our God are present, you're present there. This is what David writes in the Psalms, right? Where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee? If I go to the heights, you're there. If I go to the depths, you're there. If I go to the far side of the sea, you're there. If I re- the far side of the, settle on the far side of the dawn, you're there. Even the night is his day to you. I can't escape. Now, if you don't know the love of God and the grace of God, that's a terrifying thought. You can't get away from him. He sees everything you do, knows everything you think before you think it. But if you know his love for you in Christ, that's an incredibly comforting thought. The one person in the universe you cannot fool and cannot deceive and cannot put on a good face to is God. And he loves you. So pray. Why would you avoid him? You spend all this energy avoiding each other or putting on faces toward each other, but God knows you and loves you. And I think what prayer is, at least in my life, I presume in yours, is coming awake to this reality. Reawakening. Staying alert. Paying attention. It's easy, I think, for us to think that prayer is taking a break from real life. I've got pressures and obligations with my job and my family and my business, and then, okay, yes, yeah, yes, I should pray. In fact, some of you probably, when you hear prayer, you feel guilty, right? I don't pray. I'm not a good prayer. It's good that I'm in church because I don't pray enough. I'm going to pray more. That's not what this is. We think, if you think of prayer as like taking a break from real life to talk to God, you've got that backwards. Prayer is tuning in to real life. In prayer, God reminds you who is ultimate reality and what's really real. If you read the Chronicles of Narnia, which if you haven't, get on the program. <laughs> in, in the book, The Silver Chair, uh, there's this great part. Prince Rillian is the son of King Caspian of Narnia, and he's been imprisoned underground for 10 years by this, this wicked queen. And the, the spell over him is that during the day, and they're underground, Narnia is above. He doesn't know this. During the day, he forgets entirely who he is. He thinks this underground life is normal, and he's going to lead this underground army up to conquer someday. But he doesn't really know what's up there. He's confused about his identity. He's under her spell. But at at midnight, for a few hours at night, he remembers, he awakens to who he truly is. And so he has to be bound to the silver chair, which keeps him in place until the morning comes and he forgets again. But he's been told the reverse by the wicked witch. He's been told that this is who you truly are in the daytime, but at night you're under a spell and you go stark raving mad at night. So we have to bind you to this chair so you won't do any damage to you or to anybody else. And then you'll recover in the morning and you'll become your true self again. He has it flipped, right? You understand? And so what happens to him is this, these, it's beautiful, Aslan sends these, the Narnian characters and they free him from this and he just smashes the chair with the sword. The Bible's called the sword of the spirit, right? What is Lewis saying to us? Think about the up up there is the real life, down here is the fake life. In the daytime, you think you're living the real life, but you're actually under a spell. It's profound. You see, we tend to think that this life that I'm chasing, these things that I'm pursuing, these things that stress me out, these things that I get all pent up and worried about, this is real life. And prayer, whatever that is, is spiritual. I ought to do it. I don't know for sure what it does, but I should get with it. And it's the reverse. So many of us are walking around under a spell. Though we wouldn't say it, we think this life is all there is. We're functional atheists in a way. We live as if there isn't eternity. God isn't everywhere present all the time. Whereas Lewis said that he's walking incognito. And in prayer, when we withdraw to pray, God wants to remind us of how real he is and how illusory these things that we chase are. What ultimate reality really is. It's him and his kingdom. He breaks the spell, as it were. 
That's why I think we pray. In his book on prayer titled Prayer, Tim Keller writes that the two primary purposes for prayer in the life of the Christian are one, to experience God's love, and two, to access God's power. I think that's getting at what I was just saying. I might add a third, personally, although I haven't checked it with Keller, and that is to, uh, to align with God's will. I think that makes sense to me. Why does a child come to his father or her father? I want to know that daddy loves me. I want something from daddy. And as you grow, wisdom, guidance, a relationship of love. I think prayer in our lives are to experience God's love. What in your life do you most need that doesn't fit in one of those three categories? The experience of the love of the Father for you. Access to the power of the God of the universe. Or alignment with his will. Can you think of one thing in your life that you really need that doesn't fall into those categories. I've been trying for the last week and I can't. I don't mean weird desires and wants, I mean that I desperately truly need the Father's love, the Father's power, and the Father's will. Are you struggling with some temptation? Wrestling with unforgiveness? You need his love, you need his power. You're looking for guidance, you need his will. And we're going to see these three purposes develop more uh, fully when we, in the next two weeks as we look into the Lord's Prayer the next week and the week after before we begin the Advent series. But there's something else about prayer that I've been pondering and thinking about. And that is that, well, Eugene Peterson, who, who uh, passed away recently, some of you might know this, Eugene Peterson wrote the Message Bible. Uh, it's not a translation, it's his own paraphrase. He wrote it for his people, translating, beginning with Galatians and the Psalms, the Word of God for the people he was pastoring, and it became a really popular uh, paraphrase of the Bible. It's helpful to read alongside of a more accurate translation. I read it frequently. He also wrote a book that was a bestseller, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And I just recently finished reading his memoir called The Pastor. It's profound very different vision of the pastor as shepherd, as caregiver, than as CEO. Anyway, he's written a number of other books that I uh, really appreciate, but in, one, in many of his books, he refers to prayer as the divine conversation. It's always going on. And in prayer, we join it. What I mean is this is prayer is not just talking, it's also listening. Prayer is not uh, first speaking, it's being spoken to. I struggle with this. I'm a talker by nature. I get paid to talk. Right? I spend my life talking to people, talking about God. These are good things. But when I come to pray, I've got my list. I want to start talking to God. And that's not wrong. He wants to hear me. I'm learning again and again and again that fundamentally, first and foremost, prayer is not speaking. It's being spoken to. It's being addressed by God. Jesus. Though his life was busy and full of demands, often withdrew to lonely places to pray, to hear the voice of his father, to hear his father say, you're my beloved son, and you I'm well pleased, to be reminded again of his mission and God's will and God's presence. In his humanity, he needed that as you and I do. All of our speech, Lewis says, is answering speech. You, as a little baby, were spoken to before you ever spoke a word. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, you know that. I saw on Facebook that Doug and Lori Walton have a new baby. Grandbaby. <laughs> Lori didn't have a baby. <laughs> but you're talking to that little grandbaby, aren't you? Telling that little child how much you love them, how precious they are to you. We all do this. And eventually, as that little child grows, they begin to speak back. It's the same way spiritually in prayer. You're spoken to first by God in Christ that he loves you, that he has a plan for your life, that he's with you. And as we grow, we learn to speak back out of that being spoken to. So the starting point for prayer is God, not my desires, not my present circumstances, not my immediate needs, although God wants to hear about those for my sake, not for his, he knows already. So when we read that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray, I think that's what he's doing. Hearing from and responding to his father. Imagine for a minute you're diagnosed. 
Some of you, this won't be imaginary. With a very serious terminal illness, disease, for which there's no cure. However, well, this is a, a little aside. This is not related, but it's funny, and I'll tell you. My son's on a football team, one of the fathers spoke at a team chapel a few weeks ago, and he said when he met his wife, he's a big uh, African-American pastor down south, and he's a great guy, but he's got a different style about him. He says, when I met my wife, I found out she was diagnosed with 4S disease. She's saved, sanctified, smart, and sexy. <laughs> and he said, the best part is there's no cure. <laughs> I threatened to tell, I'm gonna, I threatened my wife, Erin, I'm going to tell that in church, but she, she threatens me back, and so I haven't until now. Anyway. Back to the analogy. Imagine, imagine you're diagnosed with a terminal illness for which there's no cure, but you can stay alive and healthy by doing two things. Taking a specific medication every morning first thing and every night before you go to bed. Every morning, every night, that'll keep you alive. If you fail any one of those in a day, you'll die within six hours. I know I'm making this up. There's no such disease, but imagine it. Would you, would you, would you forget would you leave that to your own memory? Would you say, oh, I'll remember. <laughs> no, you'd set every alarm you have and call all your friends to remind you. Like it's your life or death, right? I mean, you, you would be serious about that. You'd put reminders all over your house somewhere so you would never forget because if you don't have this, you're going to die. There's no way you're going to live unless every morning and every night you take that medication. What if, you see where this is going, <laughs> what if we viewed prayer that way? It's really a matter of life and death. And I'm speaking to myself as much as you. What if we really believed this is not just religious duty or obligation or ritual? What if deep in my heart I began to believe that there's just no way I'm going to live this life without it? There's just no possible way I'm going to survive spiritually without prayer. That I need more interaction with the Father. I long to hear him speak to me more than I'm listening now. I have things I can't tell anybody, but I can tell him. And I need his guidance. I need his wisdom. I just need time in his presence. And if I don't have that, I'm doomed. Do you think of prayer that way? I want to. I don't always. My knee-jerk reaction isn't always run to the Father, withdraw. In fact, the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, translates verse 16 interestingly. It says, Jesus um, often, um, it, so the NIV and the ESV both say that he would withdraw to lonely places. The New American Standard uh, Version puts it differently. It says that he would um, slip away. That he slipped away all the time. And I like that, that translation because it means you can slip away in a crowded room. In fact, Lewis says he likes to pray in bus stations or on a park bench with people around. You can slip away at any time. And hear the voice of your father. What if you saw prayer as life and death that you needed every day? Apparently Jesus saw it this way. He said, in the garden, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. You remember that in, in, in Matthew's uh, account of the Garden of Gethsemane? That's what he says. And in Luke, we read that he sweat drops of, like, drops of blood. Do you know this part of his prayer? Do you know what happens in Luke 22? It's amazing to me. I never, I've not really, it's, it, it's something easily missed. It says that Jesus prayed fervently, and an angel came and attended him and strengthened him. Wouldn't you think that, okay, that's, because he's praying about the cross, and the angel comes and strengthens him, that now he's ready to go to the cross. He's been strengthened by a divine angel. But what you know what the next verse is? So that he prayed even more fervently, and his sweat was like drops of blood. He was strengthened to stay in prayer. That's instructive to me. He wasn't strengthened to get off his knees and get out of it. He was strengthened to stay there, keep wrestling with God, keep seeking God. Remember that? It's life and death. There's no way. I'm going to live this life of obedience to the Father without it. Okay, so in the few moments we have, what do we do? What do we do? Well, I think we follow the example of Jesus. That's a good idea, don't you think? 
Let's follow the example of our Lord who often withdrew, who slipped away to pray. And I want to give you a direct challenge this week. Now, I know some of you have rich and robust prayer lives. I want to encourage you and affirm that. But I'm guessing many of you could use a little growth in this area. Many of you feel like, how many of you would say by show of hands, don't need it, I'm fine, I'm dialed in, I've got all the prayer I need? That's what I thought. Who's going to say yes to that? It's a trick question when the pastor asks you that. <laughs> so this week, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. Number one, slip away. In between meetings at work. As you drive in your car between appointments or to pick somebody up or drop somebody off. In between classes if you're taking classes. Between conversations, slip away frequently and speak to God and hear him speak to you. And then the second thing is this. Remember that little analogy, every morning, every night, gotta take the medication? This week, begin and end every day in prayer. Maybe this is already a habit for you, it is for me. I call it the discipline of, I don't call it that, but it's called the discipline of first thoughts and last thoughts. Martin Luther wrote morning and evening prayers. You can look these up on on Google and, and print those out if you want. Just a simple way, when you get up in the morning, don't turn on your cell phone, don't turn on the news, before you get in the shower, before you brush your teeth, before you do anything, go to the bathroom, that's fine, right? But after that, the first thing that you should do is turn your heart to God. Just simply and humbly, even if it's for a a couple of minutes or 45 seconds, just turn your heart to God. Thank Him for the day. Ask Him to make you aware of His presence throughout the day. And then at night, last thing you do before you go to bed, this week, Take a little inventory with God. Confess if you need to. Thank him for watching over you. Ask him to guide you through the night. Just this week alone, let's start our day and end our day with God and let's slip away throughout our day to be with him. There's just no way, friends, we're gonna become the kind of men and women or live the kind of life he wants us to live without it. That's a lifestyle of prayer. Lifestyle of prayer is not spiritual hocus pocus. It's not for the spiritual elite. It's simply those who know and recognize I've got nothing if I don't have God and I want to be with him. And here's the great news. He so wants to be with you. He wants to be with you. He wants to realign your heart, reorder your loves, and speak his truth into your life. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, it's so easy for us to look at your son Jesus and think that he didn't need prayer the way we do or that he somehow because of his divinity was immune to the pressure and temptation. But that is not true. And we look at his life and we see a life lived in humble obedience to you and a life marked by prayer. We thank you, God, that you are not aloof. You are not far off. You're not distant and unconcerned. You're closer to us than we are to ourselves. And forgive us because we're walking around in a dream world most of the time. So, Father, wake us up this week. Wake our hearts up to the reality of who you are every morning, every night, and in little moments in between that we might tune our hearts to sing your praise. We pray this in your name because of your death and resurrection for your sake and glory, Lord Jesus. Amen.